sing some okay. song. Hello, hello. Song you should A song? sing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, nice I want to punish him more than I have to. <laughs> nice t-shirt. Well, good morning. Um, I see it's a very hard morning for many people. <laughs> so, uh, okay, uh, when you will want to evaluate decisions, you can uh, visit this link. And now, please uh, welcome new presentations about uh, Open IPA. <laughs> Um, everyone can hear me? Okay, good. So uh, my name is uh, Audie Lee, and um, looks like there was a pretty busy night last night, so uh, let's look around. But um, I've been working, I work at Red Hat, um, and I've been working in the dog tag certificate server team uh, for the last few years. Um, and I've also been working as a, a core developer for the Barbican open source project. Uh, Barbican is uh, secrets as a service, and that directly ties into sort of the identity work um, that we're doing here. Um, Rob. Uh, I'm Rob Crittenden. Uh, I've been working at Free IPA for, I don't know, six, seven years. Um, I dabble in OpenStack. Um, and so that's about it. I work at Red Hat also. Okay. 
So um, a lot of the work uh, that we're going to present here is done by the members of, of uh, the team that we're involved in. Um, and so the other members of these team um, have been pretty active in OpenStack um, as well as in Free IPA for a long time. Uh, Adam and Jamie are both uh, Keystone developers um, and have worked a lot on uh, a lot of the different parts of what we will present here, which was part of a demo that we did for the, the Tokyo Summit. Um, Rich, uh, who is here, um, and will bail us out when we have questions about this, um, worked on the original uh, IPA join service, um, which, which Rob is going to talk about. Uh, John Dennis worked a lot on the EC2 SAML integration stuff. Uh, Robbie Harwood um, worked on uh, MariaDB and Kubernetes MariaDB. Um, and uh, Nathan, uh, who's our, our manager, is a, is a Keystone developer as well, too, um, and will also be someone that will uh, bail us out if we can't answer anything. So, um, so it's a pretty, pretty straightforward agenda for today. Uh, we're going to do a brief introduction to IDM or I IPA, uh, a very brief in introduction to, to OpenStack. Uh, there have been a lot of presentations um, over the last couple of days for both OpenStack and, and IPA, so um, most of the concepts and, and, and everything should be pretty familiar uh, to most people here. Um, we'll then talk about how IPA fits into OpenStack um, and the types of integrations that we're trying to do. Um, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the proof of concept that we did in Tokyo and hopefully demo at least some of, um, some of what was there. So, Rob. Yeah. All right, uh, so who here is familiar with IDM IPA? So I can kind of gauge how, okay, so I'll go over the details. All right, so uh, it's basically identity management system. So you're dealing with users and user groups and hosts and groups of hosts. Um, and managing access control for all of those things and storing them centrally. So at the heart of IPA is an LDAP server. Uh, we use 389DS and we have a number of custom plugins that do um, things like uh, synchronized passwords um, between the LDAP password and the Kerberos password. So you have a, a single password everywhere. Um, we use MIT Kerberos or for our KDC. Um, uh, the PKI is Dogtag, the product that Adi works on. Um, we have bind integration, so uh, LDAP, again, is the back end for bind. Um, the CLI and UI uh, have the basic same framework, so anything you do in the command line, you can do in the UI and vice versa. Um, so let me talk about the architecture a little bit. Can you hit? So I'll go back. I'm just testing you now. Let me talk a little bit more about this. So, um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Client here, I, okay, so we don't do anything fancy. This, we're just gluing a lot of things together. Uh, if you've ever installed Kerberos yourself, uh, it's like an all-day affair. You probably get it wrong four or five times. And so the goal of IPA was to make this consumable. So it's one command, you install it, and everything's ready for you. And then you just have to concentrate on users and groups and things that you care about, not, you know, where do I get my next principle from? Um, so the client here, which isn't shown really, uh, is SSSD, is System Services Security Daemon, something like that. Um, and it does most of the grunt work that users see. So it has, it's caching like NC LSD, and um, uh, it has offline support. And it, it's honestly what most people think of when they think of IPA. Um, so it also enforces host-based host access control. Um, so you can say, this user or group of users can do uh, certain PAM things on this group of hosts or host. Um, and that's pretty powerful because then you can start uh, saying that, you know, administrators only can log into this set of hosts. And maybe they can only log in every SSH. They can't do other services. Um, there's also a lot of uh, web integration um, so that you can tie into the PAM stack and have PAM enforce um, only certain users can access this remote service over the web. Um, but again, this is all client stuff, and I, I'm a plumber. I did all the server stuff. Uh, let me show you an example architecture. Can you go to the next? Uh, so one piece that I didn't talk about before is Active Directory integration. 
So in the past, we did syncing, where we'd sync the AD users over to IPA, and you could use them that way. Um, and there was a way to share passwords between AD and IPA. Um, but that was problematic because um, Active Directory administrators tend to not like to install things on their domain controllers, and they don't really like other people poking at their database. Um, so instead, um, we're using uh, AD Trust. So to Active Directory, IPA looks like just another forest. Um, and, so, and it's all pretty seamless. Now, right now, it's only it's one-way trust that, that works. So Active Directory users can log into uh, Unix um, systems and you know, do pretty much anything any other user could do. Um, we're working on the other way. It's a slow, hard process. Um, but typically, this is the way it looks. So an administrator may be an Active Directory administrator. He may not be. He can use a browser and access it all sort of seamlessly. Um, this is what. So here's the client. So we have SSSD as a client. CertMonger is a really cool tool that's used to manage certificates. Okay, so DogTag will issue certificates for IPA users, and CertMonger can do that request for you in one command, and it can also do renewal. So you never have your certs expiring at 2 in the morning on Christmas, um, which they always seem to do. Um, so if you get nothing out of this talk, the CertMonger is something to look at. Um, so, and then the business applications, these modules I was talking about, these are the, uh, Jan Padziora has a number of, of modules too. One can look up identities out of SSSD, so you log in as yourself, and then you can get all your groups uh, in Apache, and they're set as environment variables, and that way you can enforce business logic that way, without having to go to LDAP yourself and get the data. It's just all there. And then, like I said, there's some PAM access modules and some other cool stuff. Um, you can go through an IDP. IDP is a, a SAML concept. Does anyone know what SAML is? Uh, it's another single sign-on protocol. I'm not going to get into it too detailed because I don't want to use the entire talk. Uh, but, but so this all sort of feeds together. Um, so you have your users from AD, from IDM, uh, and then you can just do your work, which is probably what you guys care about most. So that's IPA in a nutshell. So um, we'll talk a little bit about OpenStack. Uh, how many of you are familiar with, the, with OpenStack and the components of OpenStack? A little, little bit more. There have been a lot of talks about OpenStack, so I imagine. Uh, but basically, OpenStack is cloud software, right? So um, the mission statement kind of says exactly uh, what you're trying to do. Um, it's to create a, a cloud computing platform that meets the needs of public and private clouds. Um, and the idea, of course, for it being simple and scalable um, and all that good stuff. Um, OpenStack is basically uh, a set of components. Each component has a project name uh, associated with it. So um, I'm just going to go through a couple of these because um, uh, you're probably familiar with these. Um, so Nova, for example, is the compute server. This is the one uh, that you use to create uh, servers, whether they be virtualized or bare metal. Um, and, of course, in order to do that, it needs images, which it gets from Glance. Um, Swift is an object store, um, which is scalable and redundant and so on and so forth. Uh, Neutron provides networks. Uh, Cinder provides block devices. Um, Heat provides uh, templates where you can orchestrate putting all of these things together and the deployments and so on. Uh, Solometer is monitoring and so on. Keystone, um, which... Uh, you may or may not be as familiar with uh, Keystone provides authentication, a sort of a central authentication store uh, for everything. And in particular, it has sort of a directory of, of users and groups, um, and um, it issues tokens um, as a result of this. So what typically will happen, will happen is that Keystone actually is uh, configured to use an external identity provider, something like IPA um, or uh, some other. Uh, mechanism, um, and it takes the you gets the users and groups from that identity provider, um, and in the Keystone database is actually just mappings between those users and groups um, and projects and roles or tenants and roles within OpenStack, um, and so the, the when someone goes to Keystone to authenticate, they'll be redirected to that identity provider. They'll authenticate there. Um, and Keystone will use those uh, users and groups to map to tokens, which it'll then pass on, um, and then you, it, which are then passed on to the different services uh, to allow you access in different ways. Horizon um, is just a dashboard um, that allows you to control things with the UI. Um, 
one thing that's not on there uh, that is useful, that is, um, is the one that I work on, um, is Barbican. Barbican provides secrets as a service. Um, so for example, um, in the case of volume encryption, Cinder will store uh, volume encryption keys for volumes that you'd want, to, you'd want to mount to different VMs, and Nova will then go and collect those with the appropriate keystone token, will uh, be able to retrieve those, um, those uh, encryption keys when it actually mounts the volume. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. So just briefly, some uh, kind of an interaction between these, as may be a little harder to see. Um, but in the, in the center, you've got the compute node, which is, a, uh, which is Nova. Um, and of course, Neutron's going to provide networks for Nova. Um, you know, again, uh, Glance is going to provide images. And, um, and uh, we've got block storage from Cinder. Um, these images and so on will actually come from Glance, who might actually store those images, will actually just catalog the images and store them in Swift. Um, and finally, of course, you're going to get Keystone that's going to provide identity to everything over here. So each of the um, OpenStack services has a fairly uh, generic um, type of structure. Um, at the top over here, you've got an API call, so you have a REST interface uh, where you can make calls uh, to handle e to manage each of the different resources that are there. Um, on this side over here, um, each of the services is also going to talk to a database. Um, they're also going to talk to a messaging queue. And finally, at the back end, they may talk to some other service or they may talk to some other devices. In the case of Cinder, this could be local storage or it could be a Swift storage, a Swift store. Um, in the case of Barbican, for example, it could be IDM um, or uh, hardware, hardware module or something like that. Um, so it's a very generic um, uh, sort of overview of things, but uh, what's going to become important because uh, when we look to secure some of these services, we're going to be looking at securing each of these individual endpoints. So we'll want to secure the, the REST API on top here. We're going to secure this communication here, this communication here, um, and certainly anything back here. Uh, we've probably had a number, we've had a number of talks about triple O um, as well too. Um, the basic point over here is that triple O is OpenStack over OpenStack. Um, and the idea is that you're going to have a small um, bootstrap uh, deployment network here, which is just uh, usually typically a single node uh, that has all the OpenStack services there. Uh, and you're going to use, and that's called the undercloud. Um, and you're going to use the uh, heat templates over here within the undercloud to actually deploy the, the cloud that you desire up here, which is the overcloud. So that's the idea of triple O. Okay. And so, for example, over here uh, on the left-hand side here, we've got our undercloud. Our undercloud has each of the different OpenStack components inside there. Um, and it's going to be using the, t the heat templates over here to deploy different kinds of nodes inside the, open, inside the overcloud. Um, you might have a controller node. Controller node will have pretty much all of the services there. Um, or you could have more specific types of nodes, like a compute node which would just run various Nova uh, instances, as well as storage nodes, uh, like a Swift storage node, or a Ceph storage node, or some other kind of storage node over here, or a block storage node, which runs Cinder. Um, and you can, the idea would be that you could scale this as, as large as the, your cloud uh, becomes. So typically, for example, you're going you're gonna to want to have three controller nodes um, for HA, and those will be configured in an HA configuration um, to allow uh, redundancy and so on. So that is uh, briefly an introduction to IDM um, and to OpenStack. Let's see where they kind of join, they fit together. Okay. So there, there are three possible scenarios you can sort of think of in terms of how to fit IDM into OpenStack. Um, the first idea is that you have IDM as a standalone component um, that you can use to secure the, the infrastructure, both the undercloud and the overcloud controllers and the nodes. Okay, and I'll be talking about that, and that's, that's one of the things that's actively been working on right now. Um, the second is as a standalone component, which you can use to secure access to the VMs and the servers that are created uh, by the user um, in the overcloud. Um, and uh, Rob's going to be talking about that. Um, and then the last one is finally, if you have IDM, the IDM server running in a VM that's created in the overcloud, and then you have other VMs that are created in the overcloud that need to join to IDA, IPA as a client. So, 
So in this first scenario, um, you're trying to, to secure the infrastructure using an IDM server. So the idea is that you have an IDM server that, that's standing by itself. It's in the infrastructure itself. Um, and we're going to use it to, both in the over cloud and in the under cloud, to make things a little more secure. Um, the one thing about OpenStack is, is like everything else, um, uh, everything was, was developed uh, you know, without security because people want to get stuff done. Um, and then as a result, um, uh, at the end, you have a wonderful cloud that can do all of these wonderful things, but that is completely insecure. Um, and so uh, IPA is one way of, uh, has, some, has the, the tools and the ability to, to be able to make a lot of this secure. So uh, the first thing we're going to do uh, for each of the nodes, whether they be controller nodes or... Um, uh, in the under cloud or the over cloud is we're going to um, register the host as an IPA client. Uh, and we'll do that by running an IPA client install on each of those. Um, and this allows the hosts, it'll create a host entry inside the, um, uh, inside the IPA database, which will allow the host to be placed in a host group. Um, and when you place the host in a host group, you can uh, assign things like pseudo policy or HBAC, uh, host-based access control policies, and um, you can do all of the things that Robert mentioned about in terms of these, 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 these policies. So you can basically specify who can go, in, can go into these different hosts and what they can do there. Um, it also allows you to retrieve key tabs because it'll, it'll configure Kerberos on these different hosts to, be, uh, to talk to the, the central Kerberos and get uh, any kind of key tabs and user certificates um, and um, will be allow you to be able to authorize you to, to do various kinds of IPA operations. And one of these kinds of operations um, is the retrieval of certificates. So there are a number of places here where you can use certificates in order to secure things. Um, this is, uh, these are three controllers over here. These three controllers are arranged in an HA configuration. So at the top level, um, you've got all of the services which are actually exposed through HA proxy. Um, and um, so Keystone, Cinder, Neutron, all of those are exposed by a, central, by a single point there out in HA proxy um, for the REST API. Um, and HA proxy uses Pacemaker and so on to uh, rotate the VIP between um, the different uh, HA proxy will rotate between the different controllers over here. So if we have one controller goes down, uh, the traffic will be redirected to the other two controllers. Um, in order to secure that connection, we need uh, to use to TLS. As you get TLS, we use Certmonger uh, to go to IPA and go to IPA and get the certificate. Okay. So that uh, typically what you would do there um, is on the on the undercloud machine where you're running the heat templates um, in order to create these different con uh, controllers, you would run certmonger there, get the certificate, um, and then you would copy the same certificates and keys all through all three controllers. Then on each of those controllers, you can ask certmonger to track the certificate so that in the event that it expires, or it's getting close to expire, um, one of these controllers, uh, say one of the, the master controller, as it were, will go through and try and renew that certificate. And then the other two controllers will retrieve the certificate from the specific entry within the IPA. Um, so that makes make sure that, that you're, you're um, you know, on Christmas Day, uh, 12 o'clock on Christmas Day, your certificates will expire on you. Um, on the back side of here, the other thing we can do is we can create service users for each of these, uh, each of the services. So Keystone will have its own service user, Neutron, and so on. Uh, and we can retrieve certificates through Certmonger for each of these different users. Um, and then we can take these client certificates um, and we can talk to either the Rabbit, uh, RabbitMQ, uh, the, the Mirrored queue over here, the message bus, or we can talk to the database and we can secure those connections both using TLS. Um, in the uh, videos, uh, we, we created a couple of videos for the um, uh, the OpenStack Summit in, in, in Tokyo, um, and uh, one of the things that Adam Young was able to show was um, an, in a default configuration, uh, you could go through and you could see all kinds of passwords and all kinds of plain text things when you talk to, to the database if this wasn't secured, um, because the, the, the password, when you connected, you could see the password and plain text and so on, um, and that's never a good thing. Um, so 
uh, you can either use Kerberos or you can use uh, client certificates uh, to secure these different connections. So just to recap a little bit, um, you're going to create service users for each of the different services. Uh, you'll use Certmonger to get the cert for the HA proxy. Um, you're going to secure the connection to the messaging queue using TLS using the service user certs. That way you, uh, the messaging queue knows exactly who's connecting to them um, and they uh, secure the connection. Um, Cupid, which is the, what we actually ended up using in the, um, uh, in the demo, uh, we used Kerberos um, to uh, secure as well too um, with varying results. Um, and uh, you can also secure the connection to the database using TLS, using the service user certs. Um, you could try using Kerberos. Um, there will be a Kerberized MariaDB available in the next release uh, of MariaDB, and uh, full Kerberos encryption will be available uh, in following after that. So it's possible to use Kerberos as well in order to, to secure these. Um, and then finally, uh, just to keep in mind, Certmonger so keeps track of all of the certificates um, so that when they need to be renewed, uh, they will be renewed automatically. Okay. The other thing, of course, you can, that you can do um, is that uh, because we have host-based access controls, uh, we can specify who has the ability to uh, access the, the OpenStack services in the cloud. Um, and so, uh, for example, uh, this is very useful if you have a private cloud. Um, uh, for the undercloud, you want that to be a very restricted set of people um, that are, is allowed to get there. So maybe certain lab admins are the only ones that are allowed to get there. And you might want a larger group um, to be able to uh, access the overcloud controllers. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, w within your within the corporate IT, um, you know, IT itself would maintain the undercloud, and then the overcloud could be made available to uh, company wide or to all of the developers in the company or something like that. Um, corporate IT, in fact, um, uh, very often. Um, uh, let's say that all the users and groups and so on are in AD. Um, as Rob mentioned, you know, AD controllers don't, uh, don't particularly like uh, people going in and messing with their, uh, with, with their entries, but the identity can be federated through, through IPA, through trusts. Um, and so uh, a lot of times when you're, when you're putting in an OpenStack deployment and you're bringing it into, into an environment, there are authentication stores that are already there. People aren't going to make it, are going to want to, you know, to duplicate all of those users and groups within Keystone or with an IPA necessarily. But you can federate um, the identity through here um, so that makes it easier to deploy within an existing infrastructure. So that's kind of nice. Um, the other thing that you can do is that you can set up web SSO and, uh, and single sign-on and CLI single sign-on uh, using either Kerberos or, or SAML. Um, and I'll just go through a couple of, I don't think it's not running out of time, so we'll go through just one of these. Um, so um, uh, here's a case where, uh, I'll actually demonstrate this hopefully at the end of this. Uh, but here's a case where someone is logging into Horizon, uh, and one of the things they can do, so uh, they can get a Kerberos ticket beforehand. Um, that Kerberos ticket goes through their browser, um, and they go to Verizon, Horizon, and they want to connect into Horizon. Well, Horizon at that point can redirect their browser to Keystone, um, and then you have various Apache modules that go through and process the requests. So mod auth GSS API retrieves the user's uh, ID and so on um, from uh, the Kerberos token. Um, we go through here, we use mod lookup identity to retrieve uh, from the IDM server to retrieve things like the groups uh, and the roles for that particular user um, through SSSD. And ultimately, that information, the users and the groups get passed to Keystone, where there's a mapping between the groups uh, and the users to specific projects and roles. Um, and there's a token then that is then issued by Keystone um, to, and sent back. So then the token over here is sent back to the browser, which gives it to Horizon. And then Horizon can use that token to determine whatever it is that you're supposed to be able to do with an OpenStack. Um, 
There is, uh, here's another one, which I'm not going to go through now, but this is basically the same uh, idea using SAML. Uh, the difference here um, is that um, you have model of Mellon, which is doing, uh, can, which is doing the, the SAML uh, work over here, and it talks to something like Epsilon, um, which will work with IDM to retrieve the users and groups. Um, you, get, you still use mod lookup identity in order to get the, the group information, and what you'll end up with is a SAML assertion, um, and that SAML assertion will then go to Keystone. Keystone will determine uh, from that SAML assertion, we'll, we'll, we'll know things about users and groups, um, and so on, and ultimately uh, create a Keystone token, um, which will be sent to Horizon. So. Okay, so um, if you want to know more about Epsilon, uh, there's a, uh, another talk later uh, today by the, one of the developers uh, for Epsilon, uh, and so I highly recommend you go see that. Okay. Uh, the third bit of, of the infrastructure has to do with Barbican, um, and uh, as this is a project I work mostly on, um, I'm pretty excited about this. Um, but Barbican is, the basic idea behind Barbican is that there are people that are going to want to store all kinds of secrets, whether they be passwords or encryption keys or any of those kinds of things. Um, and uh, this provides a central location for people to be able to store them securely. Um, uh, most often, a lot of people try to do crypto, and they, they do crypto badly. Um, and so the idea would be to store this in a place where, uh, which has been written uh, by cryptographers, as it were, uh, to make sure that, that, that everything is secure. Um, and so in particular, we've used it for doing things like encrypting volumes, uh, encrypting images. Some of, these, some of these are ongoing efforts right now, but some of these already have already been completed. Uh, encrypting uh, objects from Swift in transit, uh, setting up neutron LBAS, uh, you know, load balancer as a service, um, so on and so forth. So various things that, that are uh, various OpenStack services that are talking to other services and, get, and, and storing secrets and retrieving secrets. Um, where IDM comes in is that Barbican has a backend uh, plugin infrastructure so that you can talk either directly to something like a, an HSM, a hardware security module, um, or uh, in, in our case, uh, I created a plugin that allowed it to talk to the dog tag KRA. The KRA is uh, just one of the components of the dog tag certificate system uh, that is used to store uh, secrets securely. Um, it's also part of something called uh, the IPA Vault, uh, which is a feature within IPA that allows you to store secrets. Um, slated to be in OSP9 uh, as tech preview, so coming up pretty soon. So just to give you a little bit of idea about how uh, Barbican works here, um, uh, basically uh, someone wants to store an encrypted, an encrypted volume, um, Cinder will actually ask through Castellan, will ask Barbican and, and the KRA to uh, generate a secret, uh, generate a key. Uh, that key will actually stay there, um, and what will be returned is just a reference to that key. That reference to gets gets kept in the metadata uh, for that particular volume. And then when Nova needs to come and attach that volume, it will get the metadata, uh, retrieve the key, um, and then attach the volume. Um, and from the point of view, and it, it, it actually attaches it in the hypervisor using a Lux encryptor in the hypervisor, so that from the point of view of the volume, it look, just looks like any other volume. And I am definitely running out of time. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, Nova has got a number of hooks uh, available for the last couple of releases. Um, and so we're utilizing uh, three of them. Uh, so when a new VM is created by Nova, or when it's destroyed by Nova, or when uh, Nova detects that there's a network change. So the idea of this is so that uh, when Nova creates an image, it's pre-enrolled in IPA so that when the user finally gets it, it's booted and everything, they can log in using their own credentials and just use it as they would any, uh, any computer they might use. And um, it can be enrolled in, when the host is created, the idea is that it's given access to one or more uh, host groups, so then you can control access at the point where the VM is created about who can log into it and what they're allowed to do there. So 
what happens is when a VM is created, this hook is called, we create a host in IPA, we create a DNS entry uh, in IPA uh, for that host and create a one-time password. And that's passed into uh, the VM during boot using cloud init. So at the end of cloud init, packages are installed, IPA client is run, and the host is enrolled. So at that point, it's ready to go for users. So you can log in as yourself, uh, do everything you can uh, uh, you know, in any other system. Um, and then, so when you're done with that, because VMs come and go in, in OpenStack all the time, Nova will automatically delete the host from IPA, clean up the DNS entries, and uh, everything is fine. Um, so the, the host class is mentioned here at the bottom. So IPA has this, this concept of auto membership. So you can create rules that say uh, member, a user, a class of this should automatically be members of these host groups. So you're not limited to a single, you don't have to, it, it, you can have more complex uh, configuration. You're not limited to a single host group per, uh, per type. Um, so you can have, you know, very complex uh, rules. And this includes sudo. So, um, you know, some VMs may have more sudo access than others, and some users also may have, the host only gives you so much access, but users still are constrained by whatever other rules there are. So this is what, I, I sort of went over, this is basically what happens with the hooks. Um, I'm not gonna go over it again, sorry. <laughs> um, all right, so here's, so th there's another twist. So OpenStack has a concept of metadata, um, and there's like 18 different names for metadata in OpenStack. It's uh, uh, parameters and you know, user data and all kinds of other things. Uh, the basic idea, and this is gonna be in, in Mataka in a big way. Um, so, that, so Glance has got a metadata service, so you, we're planning on creating an IPA metadata service. Um, so that when you create an image or you create a flavor, you can associate IPA with it and say, um, hosts created with this are gonna get a certain class. So that when you boot it, they're automatically given whatever access that you want. Um, there's also a way to override that. Um, there's a next generation launch instance, which is sort of a wizard. Uh, so it's unlike what you're probably used to. It actually walks you through all the steps. So you're less likely to forget something. And it'll actually warn you um, if you do things that aren't too bright, like it'll see, it'll, you get a little uh, a warning if you try and boot a flavor that's not big enough for the image that you've selected, for example. Um, so, and it, so it's very configurable and uh, we're hoping it's, it's the way to go. So Rich did all the, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here. Um, the dem demo at Tokyo Summit, so if you want, there's videos on it already, if you want to see this in action. Um, I'm not sure when this is gonna land and I was in, OSP at all, um, we're, but soon, we hope. Ah, oh, I guess I just mentioned DNS. So this is the one big question mark, okay? So right now, we rely on IDM for DNS, um, and you know, OpenStack administrators may not want that. They may want to use Designate, which is the DNS as a service. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to uh, do the creation and deletion of hosts. Um, so that, that's the, the one big open question, so. Yeah, and I'm just gonna briefly mention uh, the third case here. So the third case is a purely, you know, I might mention a cloud use case. Um, this is a case where you have IDM or IPA as uh, within one of the open, one, within one of the over cloud VMs. Um, and then you have other over cloud VMs that are going to uh, connect to that. Conceptually, you'd think that this should pretty much work as is. Uh, after all, whatever's in the over cloud shouldn't have to worry about what happens in the under cloud. Uh, one big question, of course, is uh, things like DNS um, and, and how that works. Um, and uh, whether or not that there's anything that we can do to make it easier for various over, over cloud VMs uh, to join IPA. Uh, but that's probably something that's a little further down the line. So um, in Tokyo, uh, we just basically had a proof of concept here. Um, uh, there's a whole lot of details on here that I'm not gonna have a chance to, to go through, uh, but you can kind of see all of the different things that we um, uh, uh, described and, and was able to demonstrate uh, in this open in this thing. We just had a single node basically with all the different servers um, and all of those connected to another node which had IPA. Um, and 
In particular, there are a whole bunch of different uh, links here specifically to videos uh, corresponding to those different notes. Um, I can try to do a bit of a demo. I just don't know how much time. So, try to decide whether to do the demo or to do a, uh, just ask questions, so. Are there any questions before? Yeah, are there any, are there any questions? Um, well, um, well, let me, uh, so we have, uh, we have scarves and uh, we have a Keystone developer t-shirt, a Keystone t-shirt over here. So the best so, Keystone question gets a really cool. So yeah, so the best Keystone question or gets a really cool T-shirt. We have swag. And then we have we have we have scores. So um, so let's go with questions and uh, we'll see if we have any time. Yeah. So, um, uh, inter in integration of IPA and things, I think, is slated for OSP 8 something. <laughs> Any other question? That was, that, that was a good Keystone question. That was a good Keystone question? All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> did everyone hear the question and the answer? Did it make sense? The question was, can I, what can I do with IBM today? Uh, and the answer was, you can't do this, but you can do LDAP auth. Uh, so Keystone can hook into a number of different identity providers. You can hook right into AD, you can uh, open LDAP, IDM, pretty much. You're just not going to get Kerberos and certificate-based access control. Any other questions? Good scarves. Everyone's got a scarf. No one already. wants a scarf. No one wants a scarf anymore. <laughs> all right. So, all right. Uh, we have one minute. We have one minute. Let's see what I can do demo. here. Okay. So, um, uh, what I've done is I've, I've uh, I don't know if you can see that. Okay. So, um, I'm using uh, export here. And now I'm just going to log in as uh, an admin. Okay, and okay, so I've um, set up Firefox over here. Um, uh, it's going to take my, I have a Kubris ticket now because I've done a K init. Um, and I'm going to go to IPA as an admin. Uh, and what I plan to do here, uh, you can see obviously that I don't get prompted for any username or password or anything like that because my Kubris credentials have been proxied through. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a, use, a new user uh, with an IPA. So we'll say, um, Bruno, and his name will be, say, Bruno Demo. Uh, I'm going to give him a password, which will, he'll be prompted to change uh, on first setup. Okay, and I've added that user. Yeah, because it, it's, a, it's not the actual password. It'll, it'll, get, it'll be forced to recess on the first, on the first usage, right? So, um, Let's go ahead and I'm going to go here. Uh, I, now I'm going to K init as Bruno. 
Okay, I'll put in that one character password, and now it's gonna ask me to change the password and actually put a real password in there with all of the password requirements and so on. Okay. Okay, and now uh, you can see I have a credential over here. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to log out here. Okay, and now I'm going to log in again, um, and this time uh, I should be logged in as the Bruno user. Um, while that's going on, I'm also going to uh, log in to Horizon. Okay, so you can see here I am as the Bruno user. Um, you'll also notice that I am in uh, the IPA users group. And for OpenStack, I'm going to say let's log in using Kubers. And so what's happening here is that uh, Horizon's being redirected to Keystone. Uh, it's getting various the users and groups and using that Kubers credential that's there. Um, and uh, what you're going to see is that I'll be in Horizon right here um, in the demo project, um, and I have various accesses, and I can, at this point, I can create VMs and so on and so forth. The reason I can do that is because in Keystone, there's a mapping um, from the IPA users group to the demo project, um, of which I'm a member, and I'm out of time. So, all right. <laughs> for presentation. Jo, připojíme prezentaci, teda notebook. Nějak teda máte 40 minut, otázky jsou included, jak nás říkají česky. Na dobré otázky můžete dát ty čály, můžete použít tři, klidně i šest. A jo, ukážu vám tabulky, když vám bude docházet čas. A co ještě? Co ještě? Jo, ještě. Tady máte stickers for speakers. A jestli můžu poprosit tu prezentaci na flešku? Je to nějak jakoby nahrávané, že 
sa máme akoby vymezený prostor, kde sa môžem pohybovať, aby pošiel nekam mimo. No, ja myslím, že jak je to podium, tak to je nahrávané celé. Jo, jo. A víc, víc nevím. Myslím, že i když je člověk tady, tak ještě jde vidět. Tak my scéně máme ty, ty budeme to muset posouvat, takže nemůžu jít daleko, ty bych šel někam do ale jenom. Tak jako budeš slyšet, ale nebudeš vidět, takže... No.